Thanks, Jens. Thanks, Rod. Uh, echo all the other speakers' comments. It's a truly a fantastic course, and it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be able to participate in my disclosures. So we've already heard a lot of great talks on, on deformity today, and so, so you know, why, why are we spending so much time on deformity? There's, there's several reasons. Um, one, uh, deformity is extraordinarily common. Uh, this is a classic paper from Frank Schwab, looking at the prevalence of, of deformity in the elderly population, looking at asymptomatic volunteers, uh, demonstrating that 68% of patients had at least a mild deformity. And of course, there are many other uh, deformity groups in our adult patient population. So bottom line is it's a very common problem. Next is it uh, has a very large clinical impact. Um, the, in study after study demonstrating the impact of adult deformity on patients. This is a nice study from Shea Bess and the ISSG, which compared the impact of adult deformity to other chronic diseases. This is similar to the study that Isaac showed earlier regarding cervical deformity, but uh, essentially demonstrating that ASD has a uh, similar impact as, uh, as cancer, as patients uh, with limited use of arms and legs. And so it's a, it's, it's a major problem. Next important piece of it is, is surgical intervention is, is beneficial. Um, and this has been demonstrated with numerous studies as well. This is a nice uh, propensity match study comparing operative and non-operative patients, which showed clear superiority of, of surgery compared to uh, similar non-operative patients. However, as you know, Kojo alluded to this morning, these surgeries are often very complicated. In this series, over 70% of patients had at least one complication. Um, so this is, you know, we're certainly helping people, um, but uh, this is a, a field that's continuing to evolve and something that we need to uh, continue to get better at so we can improve safety. ASD is a, is a broad diagnosis with, uh, it really includes a lot of different entities. Uh, there's been a long list of alignment parameters that have been studied over the years. And uh, the one common theme is uh, sagittal plane is really the, the key and has the greatest impact on, on patient reported outcomes and health related quality of life metrics. In 2012, Schwab and colleagues uh, with a collaboration with SRS introduced uh, the SRS Schwab classification system, which added the sagittal modifiers, which were the, the, really the big three sagittal modifiers that, uh, that we uh, all use and, and know about today to define our deformities. This has really set the groundwork for our understanding about, uh, about the sagittal plane. Um, however, over recent years, we, we, we see that this actually gets, is, is more nuanced. Um, it's, it's not a one size fits all, and uh, our, our targets for patients are continually evolving. Uh, one thing we know um, about uh, patients as they age is, is uh, lordosis gets lost, pelvis retroverts, the C7SVA goes a little bit forward. And that's, a, that's a normal part of aging. And so um, choosing alignment parameters that uh, target uh, normal young patients is probably not the right approach. And there's a lot of data now emerging demonstrating that if we do, uh, that that may be contributing to our, uh, our uh, mechanical complications and other issues postoperatively. For a couple of mentions of the Rusley classification, this is a, another way to think about um, about deformity classification, and has been getting more attention. Um, has a slightly different philosophy. It's, it's basically defines uh, four different sagittal profiles based on pelvic incidence and, and sacral slope, and um, you know, the, the idea being with surgery, you want to establish the ideal Rusley type in order to improve patient outcomes postoperatively, and this was a, a nice study that just came out from the ESSG, the European group, um, which demonstrated that um, failure to restore the ideal, ideal Rusley type was independently associated with mechanical complications. And you can see the difference between the, the matched and mismatched complication uh, risk uh, for these patients, which is pretty dramatic. So I think we can expect to see more studies uh, evaluating this classification scheme and its value. So once we decided a patient has a deformity, the, you know, the, the art of spine surgery and, and, and uh, deformity surgery is, you know, what's the right treatment for each individual patient? Um, not every patient with a positive balance needs a T10 of pelvis. Um, this is an example of a patient that had a, you know, a, a pretty significant forward leaning posture 
um, but had uh, you know, severe multi-level stenosis and really was assuming this posture more as, a, as part of his claudication symptoms. Um, and a, a simple decompression in this situation can help to restore a more normal alignment without, uh, without exposing the patients to a uh, large reconstructive procedure. Um, once we feel deformity surgery is necessary, the other question is, you know, can the patient tolerate it? With you know, all these massive complications, the invasiveness of these operations, uh, our oldest and sickest patients are not always, uh, are not always the, the best choice for these, uh, these big operations. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, there are multiple modifiable risk factors that we can pay attention to and that we can work on to help patients get ready for surgery. These are five of the big ones I pay attention to and have targets for each. When it comes to treatment, first step is, is characterizing the deformity. That starts with your 36 inch standing x-rays, includes all your adjuvant imaging. You wanna define you know, the location of the deformity or deformities, the magnitude of the deformity. And then one really critical piece is the flexibility. And Isaac did a really good job talking about that with the cervical deformities. Uh, but understanding is the deformity mobile, rigid? Is it completely fixed? that has a huge impact on what you're gonna to need to do, and what type of surgery you're gonna to need to do for the patient. Uh, the plan, of course, needs to include levels, the osteotomies, your instrumentation, exact configuration, how many rods, what are you doing for bone? Uh, this is the, uh, the Schwab classification of posterior osteotomies. The first two, grade one and two, are posterior column osteotomies, and three through six are increasing grades of three column osteotomies. We really reserve those three column osteotomies for the most severe deformities that are, are fixed. And uh, you know, whenever possible, trying to restore alignment through a more harmonious correction using mobile disc spaces is always desired and in general less invasive. And so that's what we try to accomplish. Um, another uh, uh, powerful reconstructive, surgery, uh, reconstructive strategy is, is using um, uh, the, the disc space and anterior approaches. Um, a lift with hyperlordotic cages, ACRs, as, as uh, Juan and, uh, and, and Mike Wang mentioned earlier, are very powerful techniques for establishing correction. And um, Mike Wang earlier mentioned the uh, uh, MISDEF-1 algorithm and alluded to uh, the second version that, that's this year. Um, this iteration um, includes more significant deformities that you may be able to tackle with minimally invasive approaches, um, given these powerful techniques such as ACR, uh, there's been a uh, ACR uh, osteotomy classification scheme that's been introduced to help assist in planning these operations. So move on to a case. This is a 66-year-old female uh, with, with a moderate coronal deformity, 35 degrees uh, of the primary lumbar curve, good sagittal plane, uh, failed all of her usual non-operative treatments. Uh, the uh, primary curve is, you know, is fairly rigid. Uh, however, had uh, uh, you know, good uh, mobile segments uh, with you know, non-fused discs uh, along the length of the deformity uh, with also a preserved uh, uh, fairly healthy appearing L5-S1 disc. I see severe stenosis at L4-5, which is likely contributing to her uh, ridiculous symptoms. And then Charlie mentioned earlier the value of identifying gas in the disc. And you know, this is uh, really a good clue that uh, exploiting these disc spaces for correction, whether that's from the back or the front, uh, can be really valuable for, uh, for achieving your correction. And so uh, for this patient, we opted for you know, a less invasive strategy um, using multi-level lateral approach and then a, a second stage posterior approach with a, uh, with a posterior column osteotomy at L4-5 to help uh, reduce some of that lateral listhesis. Um, for intraoperative assessment, I like to use these uh, uh, stitched x-rays, um, uh, which is replaced in my intraoperative 36 inch films, and with the incisions of the post-operative imaging, uh, which I did a reasonable job with correction. I want to contrast that with, with, with this patient, um, who uh, is a little more complicated, 66-year-old female uh, who had uh, multiple prior lumbar fusions. Um, uh, different from the, the previous patient, her, her deformity is intrinsic to the, uh, the, the fusion mass with uh, both coronal and sagittal deformity built into that previous fusion. Uh, she does have a, a, an available L5-S1 disc, um, but did not feel I'd, I'd be able to achieve complete correction uh, from, uh, from just uh, the fractional curve alone. So here I opted for a more 
uh, more, more aggressive correction using a asymmetric pedal subtraction osteotomy and long segment posterior fixation uh, to achieve a correction as intraoperative and postoperative imaging. And I know my time's up, I'll, I'll move through this quickly. I just want to contrast that, that you know, not every person with a previous fusion requires a three column osteotomy. This is a, a patient uh, that had also had a previous fusion, kind of a mirror image to the other, the other uh, um, coronal deformity, uh, but the deformity here is, is actually proximal to a previous fusion. So here we can exploit those disc spaces to achieve the correction here. I again opted for a less invasive approach. Um, the posterior approach with posterior column osteotomies would also be very reasonable here and use that to achieve our correction. So I just want to summarize, uh, adult deformity is very common. Properly selected patients certainly benefit. Um, it's a, a field that is ripe for, for research and improvement given this very high complication rate. And for me, it's a very exciting field. It's something I'm very interested in. Um, I expect in the next you know, five years plus, we'll see continued evolution of the realignment targets to really help uh, improve our, our patient outcomes. Uh, thanks again for everybody's attention and for the invitation. Absolutely, absolutely super. Thank you, Jay. This is uh, very, very compressed. So uh, time for a question or two, but uh, before we do that, I want to switch, uh, announce to the audience that we had a switch. We just got word from Larry Koo. He's actually doing surgery, so he has to bow out, and we'll ask Dr. Uskuyan uh, to kind of pick up and uh, go back to lateral exposures and to give us some tips or tricks that fit into the deformity aspect that Jay has just brought up. Back to you, Jay. So there's so much to talk about in this topic. Um, let me pick up two highlights. So you said in properly selected patients, what do we do with the uh, improper patients, those who don't uh, fall into the bandwidth? Right now I have a patient in the hospital who uh, basically went to a surgeon. He said, well, you don't fit in any criteria. You're on too high an opiate dose. You're on uh, nicotine. Uh, you're too big. Um, we're not going to do surgery on you. And she basically went home, became despondent, and laid in bed until she got sacral decubitai and everything for about uh, a month or more. She's now coming to us with medically deranged uh, comorbidities, and she has a complete mess, and she has a prohibitive spondylolisthesis, degenerative scoliosis. So to do anything, you need to do a major surgery. Now we're way behind the eight ball. We were behind the eight ball in the beginning. But what constructive non-surgical things can we do? Because it's easy to say, well, you don't fit into my surgical paradigm. What are legitimate options, and who should run that? Should we direct that, or should we give that up to rehab doctors? Yes, it's, it's a great question, and I think one of the most important topics with deformity. Wait, we can't hear you right now. One sec. Do it again. Start again. Can you hear so me? We, now we can hear you. Yes, thank okay, you. Great. Uh, you know, I just said that it's a, a very important question. I think one of the most important questions, uh, you know, for adult patients, that, that there's a large percent of my patients that fall into that, uh, into that category. Um, you know, I think the, the, the goal is to catch them before they start that downward spiral and end up in that totally deconditioned state where their risk now is even higher than it was before. Uh, when, once you've encountered them at that state, if, if there isn't a neurologic emergency, my approach um, is to try to work with all those people you said, have a multidisciplinary team and try to see what you can do, try to cut the opiates down, try to get her off tobacco, try to work on physical therapy, do a little prehab to see if you can help reduce some of those risks uh, a little bit. Um, but no, I, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement. So, you know, and it, it feels like rationing care and withholding care from people that need your help. And it's not always, it, there's quite a bit of gray area with these patients. Uh, in that situation, I would do my best to, to try to get them into better shape before doing the operation that I think they need if I think they can survive it. Uh, the other question is osteoporosis, and that's obviously another big deal. So what's the minimum time that we need for a substance of teriparatide to make a positive difference before you'd feel comfortable to do one of your wonderful deformity corrections? Uh, I don't think we have a good enough data to say, so it's all uh, kind of gestalt. My, my protocol, I, I prefer if patients are, 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 are good enough and can hang on long enough, uh, six months. So for Forteo and Timlos, uh, they, they uh, will typically approve for two years. So if I can hit them somewhere in the middle of that, that's the sweet spot where they can continue it postoperatively, um, that's ideal. Three to six months is, is generally um, the minimum I go for, but try to, try to catch them somewhere in the middle. And the final question is the eternal uh, three-letter curse word of deformity surgery, PJK. 
So you mentioned some of the things, but uh, where do you stand on on uh, kind of a rostral banding, bracing after surgery, uh, kind of all those things? I seem to struggle with all those somehow. And, uh, I don't think that the under correction alone is a very satisfactory option, although it seems to be very, uh, very uh, en vogue right now. So give us some of your brief hints on PJK prevention. Yeah, I mean, I think the a large part of that answer is going to come in better refinement of the alignment goal. I still think that's probably part of where we're not seeing. You know, we're just not, we're not realigning the spine in the ideal way, and it's putting undue pressure at the top. Um, I don't know if there's anything we can do to, to, to prevent it at this stage. I, I have incorporated um, ligamentous banding and uh, vertebroplasty for my, uh, my older patients in particular with the idea that trying to, you know, minimize both mechanisms of PJK. There's bony failures from, particularly from that UIV, where you get compression fractures in PJK, and then you have ligamentous failure. So my approach has been to incorporate both of those. I've been using it for the past couple of years, and subjectively, anecdotally, I've had uh, you know, some improvement, but I'm, I'm very vulnerable to, to the same things you are, for sure. A wonderful lecture. Thank you, Jay. And uh, maybe we'll ask Rod to pick up where Larry Kuhn was going to be and give us some little tips and tricks for laterals in a deformity perspective, uh, where this is becoming a very cool, as we saw in Jay's talk, but also more daunting um, uh, approach option. So thank you again, Jay. Thank you.